jump back into Revelation chapter 3 um, as we, we look at the, the, the letters to the churches. Um, again, you've got mail. Uh, the letter to Sardis is, is where we're going to be. And uh, at the same, same uh, scenario, the kind of same outline here, the, the recipients we're going to look at. Uh, we're going to look at the speaker, uh, the complaint, uh, the counsel. Uh, the warning and then the uh, the promise. What you don't see there is the commendation, com commendation, um, that some of the other churches have had, and so uh, we'll we'll talk about that when we get to it. Uh, so let's just jump right in, um, see if we can get this get out of here and and back home safely this afternoon. The recipients it says to the angel of the church in Sardis, Sardis, um, uh, Sardis. Here's here's your map again. Uh, Sardis is. Uh, um, up there someplace, as you, if you can find it. Um, about midway down, just it looks like a, the eye over Asia. <laughs> it looks like it got dotted with the, the city there, uh, Sardis. Um, Sardis uh, was a, a church with a, with a great reputation. Um, they had a lot of programs, they had a lot of things that were going on, <laughs> had a lot, of, a lot of reputation, but it was a lifeless church. And we'll talk more about that, because it's hard for us sometimes to imagine that a church that has a lot of programs and things going on is being lifeless. You think, well, there's all, all, look at all the activities. No, that doesn't mean anything. And so that's kind of what, what the church was going through, and we're going to look at that in a minute. It was a city in, in two sections. Um, the, the upper section uh, was uh, on a mountain ridge, 1,500 feet straight up. And it just kind of overlooked everything else. Um, it was uh, very well defended that way. Uh, we're going to look in a second. There's only been twice that it was conquered. Uh, the lower so lower section, uh, the second section, after after they outgrew that outcropping, as they they moved down into the valley at the very foot of the mountain, and, uh, and when they were down there, they actually found gold in the river, and that's what their reputation was built on. They were very prosperous, uh, very financially well off, until the gold ran out. But they were still living on that past, and so uh, they they still believed that they were rich, even though they weren't rich anymore. As kind of way that was. Um, Sardis' history was one of wealth. That's what I was just saying. Um, it had been conquered only twice. It is believed that the first time it was conquered was uh, by Cyrus of Persia. Um, they were attacking the, the upper portion, and they saw one of the soldiers up there, one of the guards. He dropped his helmet, and he used the crevices to go down and get his helmet. Well, guess how they got up into the building? up into the fortress. They used the crevices. Years later, uh, Alexander heard about that also. And that's how they used to get into the kingdom and into the palace there. And, uh, and so that was the two times that it was conquered. Always happened at night when people were sleeping. Is it any wonder that here shortly we're going to see that Jesus talks about he comes in the night. And if you're not ready, what can happen? The city knew what that was like, knew what that was like. Uh, the biggest temple was to the Greek goddess Artemis. Uh, uh, she was uh, the goddess of, of the hunt, of the wilderness, wild animals, the moon, and uh, chastity. Uh, the period of rise that we're looking at, the, uh, the period that we're looking at, that we would, would uh, say that that was uh, represented in, in modern culture would be the, the church state from about 1517 when Martin Luther uh, nailed his uh, thesis to the wall. Uh, about the same time, uh, right after that happened, of course, then the, 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 the Catholic Church split, and we uh, end up with the Protestant denomination also. And so that goes up through, uh, looks, uh, most people think it's about 1750, maybe 1800 is, is the time frame there. Just to give you a couple of uh, uh, shots, here's uh, the wall of, of uh, one of the walls of the uh, city there. Um, beautiful, beautiful architecture. Um, and here is uh, Artemis. Maybe if it pops up, maybe it won't. There she is, uh, the goddess. And that was the biggest temple in the area. The second biggest one was to the Roman Caesars. And so that's kind of the, kind of where where Sardis is and what's happening there. Uh, again, uh, uh, very well to do. Very uh, uh, a lot of things going on in the church. The speaker, of course, uh, these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. The seven spirits of God, the sevenfold ministry of the Holy Spirit is what we're talking here. Uh, 
And those, those are things like uh, John 14. Jesus gives us all of those, the, that sevenfold ministry of the Spirit. And he says that uh, the Spirit is the comforter, the counselor, the helper. Now, if you're here uh, uh, at Christmas Eve, we talked about what the counselor actually is. And, and I, th I thought it was pretty awesome when we, when we break it down uh, into those four, four things. Uh, uh, that a counselor is a trial lawyer, uh, a counselor is, is an advocate, uh, a dignitary, um, and that the counselor was uh, a camp counselor for kids. And that's what we're all, all in that same boat there uh, when we get right down to it. And so it's also the spirit of truth. And so when Jesus is holding these, these, these seven spirits, the spirits of God, this is what he's talking about, that the, the comfort of the counselor, the, the, the other helper, the spirit of truth, the personal presence of Christ. And he's talking about uh, the very special manifestation of Christ within the believer. He's also talking about uh, abiding presence of, of the Trinity and about the teacher and about the peace of Christ. All these things the Holy Spirit is, is there for. The Spirit is there to convict us. The Spirit is there to counsel us. The Spirit is there to help us evangelize. All those things that, that God has brought forth to us uh, that uh, we're supposed to use, Jesus holds in his hands. Wow. Wow. You see, a lifeless dying church needs the Spirit of God. And that's the church that we're talking about here, Sardis. It may be the church that we have here. So we're not lifeless. No. Let's continue on. A lifeless dying church needs the Spirit of God. It needs to seek Christ for the Spirit of God. It needs to seek the life-giving, quickening power of the Spirit. Sometimes we just get uh, so complacent that we forget what it's like to be born again. I, 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 I love it when you baptize somebody and they come up out of that water and they're just screaming and shouting. I had a guy about knock me out one time. He was baptizing me in the divorce trough. And he comes swinging out of there. I had a duck to get out of the way. You know, that's, the, that's the excitement we're supposed to have. And yet as time goes on, that excitement gets... Oh, boy. Oh, boy. And yet we get some excited about some of the dumbest things don't we? I mean, I, I make no secret of it that I'm a, a University of Michigan fan. I mean, I, I, I was raised in Michigan. I'm, that's, that's my college. And even when they're down, I still cheer for them and come in on Sunday horse. That's not why I'm horse. They play Friday night. I'll be horse next Sunday. But that's something pretty stupid, isn't it? Nobody on that football team has ever contacted me. Bo Schembrechler never called me and said, hey, could you come play for us? <laughs> he wouldn't have done that. Well, that's what been stupid. But the thing of it is, we, we, we get excited about dumb things like that, and yet something that makes a world of difference, we let slide. If we got more excited about Jesus Christ, like we do other things, sporting events, or, or, or uh, talking about Thorn, you know, uh, uh, talking about grand. If we got more excited about Jesus Christ, like we got excited about everything else, what do you think people would do? Because they, they fall in with things that are exciting. They want to go see things that are exciting. They go on vacations to do things that are exciting, right? Uh, our, our, our oldest, uh, he, he ran a man or marathon yesterday. To get, in, to get ready to run a marathon in Disney World next week at 3 o'clock in the morning. He's excited about that. I am not. I wouldn't. I don't. I told you, I don't run anymore, period. I, I could get up at 3, but I'm not running. <laughs> we need to get excited about something, and Jesus Christ is something to get excited about. We need that life-giving, quickening power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus is holding in his hands here. It's also the, 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 the dying and, and, and lifeless church needs to seek the convicting power of the Spirit. The convicting power. We, uh, uh, I, I, sometimes the world is like a snowstorm. I thought about this morning I was driving in. Because here it is, it's dark. All I can see is all this snow. And what do you want to do? You want to fixate on that hypnotizing snow to the point that you're not paying any attention to anything else around you. 
The world's the same thing. The world's just driving at us, and it wants to hypnotize us into doing the things that it wants us to do and forget about the road that you're on. Every time I looked up, if I kept, kept my eye on the road down here, it was fine. But when I looked up, my eyes wanted to glaze over. The same thing happens in the world. When we look up and get our eyes off of the road that Jesus is on, we start to glaze over and let the world conquer us. We need to focus on the path that Jesus is on. We need that convicting power of the Holy Spirit to, to make sure that we're awake when we should be awake. Huh? We need, we need to, to, to seek the fruit of the Spirit. We need to, to, to seek the guidance of the Spirit. There's that counseling portion again. We need to seek revival, the Pentecostal fire of the Spirit. We used to, churches used to have revivals all the time. And they were, they were significant. When the church has a revival today, it's pretty boring. People don't get excited anymore. People don't come out anymore. That's the problem. Look at our service today. I mean, we got people that are gone. We got people that are sick. But people should be in the house of God today, and they're not. The excitement is gone. They don't understand that. Churches have gone, the pendulum has swung one way of all fire and brimstone all the way to nothing but love. And that, that's actually in the middle is where it needs to be. Have that excitement. Realize that fire and brimstone is coming for those that don't accept Jesus Christ. If you can't get that excited, then there's something wrong. You can't get that excited, something is wrong. We need that revival, that Pentecostal fire spirit. We need the witnessing power of the spirit. We need that witnessing power of the spirit. We need to tell people what it is to be a child of the king. Not, not to, uh, well, yeah, I have to go to, I hate that right there. I have to go to church on Sunday. Oh, I can't go because I have to go to church. Oh, my God. Get over that have to. You should want to go to church. You should want to be in the house of God. The one of the problems with the Sardis church is, is, is like so many other churches. They have all these other activities going on, but they forgot what it's like to actually study. They forgot what it's like to get into the Word of God. Oh, they might have things going on for kids. They might have things going on for VBS. They might have all kinds of outreach going on, but none of it revolves around Jesus. That's the problem. That's the problem. We're not revolving around Jesus. Jesus should be our first, our first focus. And if it's not, we're a lifeless church. We're a lifeless church. Jesus not only has the seven spirits in his hand, but he holds the seven stars. And we've talked about those seven stars, about the churches and the ministers, and you're all ministers, and how, how the, the, he's showing that, that he has, that we are in his hand. The only way we can be removed from his hand is if we walk away from it. Wow. The recipient, the speaker, and the complaint, all in the first verse. The complaint, the deeds. He says, I know your deeds. You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. You have a reputation for doing all these things, but you've got to focus on God got to focus on God we get so wrapped up in, in doing things that we lose track of why we are doing them and they become just programs and they become just things to keep us active and actually what we're doing is focusing internally even though we might be reaching out we're focusing internally something to keep us make us think that we're still good Christians because we're doing these things for everybody else but we're not talking about God. We don't spend any time in the Word. We don't spend any time in prayer. We don't spend any time uh, doing those things for Him. Wow. There was no condemnation, like I said, that just the complaint that they were a dying church. How would you like it if Jesus came and had no compliment for you at all except saying you are a dying church? Wow. You say, well, wait a minute. We, we've, got, we've got Awanas going on. We've got, we've got concerts that, do, that happen. We've got this that goes on. We've got, we got, we got all these things that are going on. You're a dying church. Where's your focus? Well, it's making sure that we have all these things. To do. Don't, 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 don't get me wrong. We need to do things. Don't get me wrong. We need to do outreach. But we need to make sure our focus is first on the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That has to be our focus. If that can't be our focus, then the program that we're doing needs to be dropped. Needs to be dropped. They were a dying church. 
It had a lot going on, ministries, programs, and activities. It had a great uh, reputation among other churches. Other churches looked at it and said, that is the church we want to be like because look at everything that they've got going on. Hmm? An active church seldom sees itself as dying because of its busyness, but it has lost its focus. God. Lost the focus. It's all about making sure that we have every month filled, every week filled, every, every, every hour filled with things to do instead of maybe taking time and the thing to do is to pray and to study. Wow. Hmm. The council, wake up. I love this. First, first two words, verse two, wake up. A church is dying when it can't stay awake. Now, now don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about anybody that's dozing off this morning. Hey, if I was sitting in a pew, I'd be right there with you. Huh? But you understand what it's saying. You need to wake up. You need to strengthen what remains. You've got some things going on. You need to strengthen those. You need to power up on those. If, if, if you, you've got uh, somebody having a prayer meeting happening, you need to strengthen up. You need to spend more time in prayer. You need to have more people involved in prayer. Well, when was the last time uh, that they had an all-night prayer vigil? I've had tried to have those, and they're almost a flop. I haven't had one here. I understand that. Because it's usually younger people that come out to that because us older people can't handle it. <laughs> you know? Don't want to make excuses because I sure don't want to be not doing it. And Jesus shows up and says, why didn't you? When was the last time we had a prayer walk through the church to pray for our, our rooms? When was the last time you prayed for the sanctuary? When was the last time you prayed for the sidewalks? George Tark talked to me the other day. He says, you know, that sidewalk outside was slick. That's all we need to do is have somebody fall out there and then complain that the church won't take care of its property. We need to be praying that that sidewalk stays clear and that those walking down it feel the presence of God. When was the last time you prayed for the teen room downstairs? When was the last time you prayed for the fellowship room downstairs and also prayed for the Head Start program that meets downstairs? When was the last time you walked through your neighborhood and prayed for your neighbors? When was the last time you walked down Main Street and prayed for the businesses on Main Street? So well, there's not that many. That's right, there's not. Short prayer, and one of them's a bar. I think we have something to pray about. That's right. We are not doing the things that we should be doing. Are we a dying church? I can't answer that. But I agree with what Jesus is saying here that we need to strengthen what remains because it's about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. I have found your deeds unfinished. Oh, well, you've got great things that are happening. You've got a lot of these programs that are going on. You've got things that are, that, that, that are moving and, 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 and really could be focusing on God, but you're focusing more on making sure we get the numbers and not the spirits, not the presence. Wow. Good Strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Wow. That's the first thing he's got. Second thing, strengthen what's about to happen. The warning that he gives, verse 3. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Remember what, what we've gone through, he says. Remember, therefore, what you have received, what you've heard, the things, and, and you, you've, you've heard it time and time again that you need to pray, that we need to study, we need to be in the Word of God, we need to do uh, the Sunday schools, we need to do the VBSs, we need to do Awans, we need to do those things to get people into the Word of God, not just the kids, but ourselves. Ourselves. Remember what you've received and heard. He says, hold it fast. Hold it fast. Don't let anybody take it away from you. Oh, man. The world wants to take Jesus away from us. We need to hold on so tight that it can't be pulled away. Hold on to the things that you heard. Hold on to the things that you received. Hold it fast. <laughs> and then he says, and repent. Repent. This isn't the first church he told to repent, is it? Hmm. 
Maybe there's always something that we need to look at that maybe we need to say, I get it. I've made a mistake. It's time for me to give that up. It's time for me to repent. I want to become closer. I, I know I've you know the I've gotten involved in programs before and I really didn't want to and 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 and, and I it showed in my attitude and, 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 and I am sorry because I made it more about me than I, about you. Wow. It says if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief. The town understood, Sardis understood what it was like to be taken over in the middle of the night. Because it's happened to him twice. Happened to him twice. And Jesus says, if you don't wake up, I'm going to come like a thief and overtake everything again. Hmm? Oh. The promise, verse 3, or verse 4, yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. There are some people in, in that congregation that are still doing the things they're, they're called to do, and they're putting God first. They're putting God first and foremost. And Jesus says, they will walk with me. They're, they've soiled in, in, the, in the world they live in, but they will be dressed in white. Wow. Because they are worthy. And I love that. They will walk with me. Wow. Verse, uh, verse uh, 5. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. The one who, 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 who repents, the one who corrects themselves, the one who gets back on track following God, the one who gets back on track uh, studying and opening the word, the one who gets back on track uh, asking for the power of the Holy Spirit, the one who gets back on track evangelizing, the one who gets back on track uh, praying that, 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 that when people come in contact with them, that they know they've been in contact with the Holy Spirit, not for their glory, but for His glory. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life. Don't confuse the book of life with the bat Lamb's book of life. The book of life is just that, life and death. When we are born, that's the book of life. The second book, the book, the Lamb's book of life, is when we accept Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior. He says, the one that is dressed in white, white, I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. Oh. Can you imagine standing before the throne of God and Jesus says, I know Rhonda. Father, she's all right. Let her in. I know Mike, I know Joni, I know Jim, I know, I know, by name, by name. Wow. Not, hey boy, huh? like I do with Thorne, huh? but by name. He knows us. And he'll never blot our name out, but he'll stand before God and announce us. Wow. Announce us to his father and his angels. Not only does he announce this to God, he announces to all of his, all of his, uh, 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 his, his entourage there. Hey guys, you're not going to believe this. Is, remember that one that we just kept laughing at all the time? This is Jim. This is him. Huh? And he's with us now. Huh? Wow. It says, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Huh? Again, it's a letter that's specifically written to Sardis by name, but it's written to us. It's written to all the churches because he says, whoever has ears, ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Multiple, multiple. Wow. I pray that Jesus would not come back or even send us a letter that says that we are a, a dying church or a lifeless church. I think we have life. I think we do things the right way. Do I think we could do it better? You betcha. There's always room for improvement. And as long as there's still 440 some people in this town and we don't have 440 of them here, there's work to do. Huh? 
You say, well, we do 10%. We have 40 usually. Well, that sounds good, doesn't it? Then let's shoot for 20 and 30 and 50. Because that's what God's called us to do. Just to witness for him. I pray that we are in a a live, active church. That Jesus would always have something good to say about us. Why don't you stand this morning and we'll close. Father God, we do thank you again. We thank you for the words that, that uh, uh, John has put down so well in print. Your words. We ask now that you would just guide us, Father God, that, that we would use that spirit that, that he holds in his hand, that spirit that he, he has sent to us as a counselor, as a helper. Help us to reach our community for you. Help us to focus on you. May you be the first thing we think of in the morning and the last thing we think of at night. May we glorify our risen Savior in all that we do and all that we say. And we'll give you the praise, honor, and glory that you so well deserve. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless. Have a great Sunday.